Hey everybody, this is Hercules Pedix, founder, curator, docent, and gift shop employee of the Hercules Pedix Academy of Comic Book Studies. Today we're going to be looking at Epic Illustrated number 30, the June 1985 issue. Uh, we start off with a Bertie Wrightson cover. So, uh, after so long without any Bernie Wrightson, now within like two or three issues we got Bernie Wrightson twice. Pretty nice sci-fi cover. I would never even guess that was Bernie Wrightson, if you didn't tell me. Uh, it's nice, but um, nothing very Wrightson about it. Just pretty good sci-fi art. Contents page. An overview. Uh, okay, last Galactus story, chapter five, the end of the earth. Galactus recently found out that the Fantastic Four are long dead, and he made a vow to them never to eat earth. But, you know, they're, that's mil millions of years ago. So, uh, Galactus, after all these millennia, finally gets to eat earth. Pretty epic uh, panels here, but whatever. It's not that it's John Byrne. Sorry, I should say later John Byrne. Three years earlier, John Byrne would have drawn the shit out of this. It made it way better. And then he's uh, consumed Earth. But this one last Earth city, Nova made sure that uh, like it was cast off safely. It was just floating through space with that little robot inside, the Shakespeare robot. And Galactus informs Nova that the trail of exploded galaxies leads to this lens and not beyond. So he's gotta, so he's gotta go to the core of the Milky Way. Oh man, seems like the art's getting duller. <laughs> oh, here we have an, uh, another couple of beautiful full color Cerebus stories by Dave Sim and Gerhard. And once again, I mean, I like Dave Sim Cerebus, but Gerhard's the star of the show here. Just not only drawing all the beautiful background illustration, but the colors on this, just so nice. I wish uh, there was more color Cerebus. Um, but let's not slight Dave Sim and his amazing lettering ability. Great logo. Dave Sim's definitely, I, I don't even, it's inarguable. He's the best letterer comics has ever had. He's the most expressive letterer where you can actually hear how the characters talk by reading his word balloons. It's, it's amazing. There's really no one like him where he, it's almost like when uh, Alan Moore took over writing or started writing. And all of a sudden, comic writing jumped up. It's like, oh, you can do this in a comic. And, uh, well, I guess there was a few guys before him, but on a regular basis. But I, th I think Dave Sims that way for lettering. And this is, we see Cerebus, young Cerebus. He's a little kid. He's pretty cute. He's just dragging this sack behind him. And he whams it on the ground in front of these other little kids. And then the bag opens, and apparently it was one of the little kids that Cerebus was uh, <laughs> dragging around in the sack, like mauling him, and they all put uh, coins in his hat. You know, he's selling insurance, like some mafioso. The Girl Next Door, another tale of young Cerebus. Man, look at this. Fucking Gerhard, man. That's some impressive stuff. So it looks like Cerebus, young Cerebus, is going to crush on this little girl. But he's totally terrified. He doesn't know, you know, how to deal with girls. And he sees her picking some berries, and he's like, I'll gather some flowers for her. And he's all ready with his bouquet. But he gets so scared that he just picks up a rock and throws it at the back of her head. And as he runs off... He just has hearts. Like, he's so in love with her, but he does not express it. So the, all he could think to do is throw a rock at her head. And the little girl's crying. I like that. I probably would have done something like that when I was a little kid. 
This is a, a little article. Infinity, where rock and fantasy art meet. <laughs> it's kind of lame, this. Uh, apparently, there was some, uh, there's some rock musician back then named Spider Barber. And he made an album called Infinity. And I guess a lot of the lyrics were sci-fi-ish or fantasy-ish. And so he lived in upstate New York near all these famous artists. So he got them all to illustrate a song. So it was this like big concept album. It's got Diana Graziunas, Graziunas Jim Starlin's partner. Uh, Anita F. Barber, apparently probably his wife. Glenn Peppel, I'm not familiar with him. Jim Starlin, <laughs> it's pretty cheesy. Everyone else does a nice painting. Jim Starlin just draws this like fanzine illustration. There's the Bernie Wrightson cover. Metal Man, that's where they got the cover from. And Jeffrey Jones. Beautiful painting by Jeffrey Jones. Alan Wilson, not familiar. Dan Green, the famous uh, comic book inker. For the most part, every now and then he drew and painted. John J. Muth, very beautiful painting there. This Dan Green is so tiny, I really can't tell what's going on. Maybe it's just an abstract, I don't know. And then Alex Bialy. I remember this guy, see them some, some credits somewhere. Cobalt 60, the next chapter. So we see the aliens on their ship and they're getting ready to meet the radio people so they can get all that uh, that loot to scavenge. Then we cut away to Cobalt with his friend Franklin and he's teamed up with general history of the lizard, I'm sorry, crocodile people. Once again, they're just morons. These crocodiles, are, they just kill each, over, kill each other every like 20 minutes, there's a fight breaks out and they shoot each other. Then the rest of them just eat them. So we find out the little backstory. Uh, Franklin asks him how he knows this general history. And I guess Cobalt 60 has a flashback to when he was a little kid. You know, he was raised by uh, his guardianess, Old Mog. And uh, she taught him how to read. And one day he was out. And uh, he saw these big crocs killing a little tiny croc. Or trying to. And he saved his life. Nursed him back to health. And ever since then, general history has been his friend. Franklin asks how old, what happened to Old Mog, And Old Mog died fighting the radios. Uh, the radio people. Took 30 soldiers to bring her down. So he, she was a mean old cuss. And, uh, and so Franklin realizes, like, that's why I've wondered about this. How come you, who have no visible sign of mutation, hate the radio people so much? And uh, that's why <clears throat> he wants revenge. His colors are kind of weird. There's some pretty colors here, but they're just kind of slapdash and I don't know, very odd. We cut back to the aliens. Um, they're very worried about what Cord Wainer. Cord Wainer is like their, the worm guy. He's uh, kind of like their high priest. And he's seeking fissionable materials. And they're like, oh, he's going to be pissed off, man. There's no fissionables here. The radio people show up for their parlay. Oh, page 55. Got to continue. And Cobalt 60's checking him out with some binoculars, and he he sees that the Strontium 90 is there incognito, the leader of the radio people. So he sends his buddy Franklin to do some recon. And Franklin swoops in. He kills like about 20 radio guys. He's quite formidable, just like Cobalt 60. And then he comes back 
And Cobalt 60 tells general history and the troops, it's like, we're ready. We're ready to attack. Mama, soon I shall have revenge for you and old Mog. So next issue, we're going to see a big battle, I imagine. Okay. Unicorn Autumn. This is another one of those examples where some artist came to Epic. Some new artist named Alex Parenzi. And Archie Goodwin wrote a story for him. This is this weary old unicorn. Yeah, can't remember the last time we've seen another unicorn. Kind of nice art. He comes to this old ruin. And he finds a statue, kind of like a beautiful angel. And he hears these voices, these rasping and ugly voices. And he sees these trolls. And uh, they're basically just destroying any statue, anything beautiful. They're just destroying the whole city. I guess they want just want the stones for their own things. They're uh, breaking up the city so they can make their own altars and cairns. And he sees them heading for this beautiful angel statue, which he almost has this affinity for. And he tries to fight them. But there's just so many trolls. So he kills all the trolls, but he's mortally wounded. And as he dies, he looks up at the, the beautiful statue's face and a snowflake lands on the cheek and melts. So it appears to be a tear. Just kind of a little, uh, uh, kind of, I don't know what it is. A little fantasy vignette. Ah, oh, here we have another beautiful Ken Williams piece. The sign. Uh, it's written by Joe Duffy. It seems like Kent, uh, they didn't know what to do with Kent Williams, but they loved his art. So they'd just be like, Joe, write him another story. Joe Duffy wrote a bunch of stories that he illustrated in Epic. Man, this is nice. And we see this wandering swordsman and he's trying to find lodgings for the night. And he uh, he's he's where he wears the sign. He must be one of them. So the innkeeper is like, oh, if I'd only known, I would have turned him away. I didn't notice it. So the people from the village say, hey, we don't wear that shit openly here. I gotta say, I've never. I really like this, especially for painted art. The word balloons instead of having the little tail just has this beautiful ink line. Very like loose and uh, it really works. So we find out the name of this wandering swordsman, Sasuke. And this, look at this weird messenger. It's like a hand. Well, I don't know what's, almost two legs that taper down into weird roots. And he informs them our demon lord of shadows. 
Kagesama comes. And they say, have you ever seen our demon lord before? He says, two years ago in Hokkaido. One of the village people says, but I was in Hokkaido then, and you were not among us. I remember it well. We slaughtered an entire village of farmers that night to the last woman and child. And he says, you missed one of us. So they realize he's an enemy coming for revenge. He's one of those little kids. Or I guess he wasn't that little. It was two years ago. And they attack him. But he's too masterful for them. He's mowing him down with the sword. Great two-pager here. I love this. The vertical panels. And then this coming over everything. This killing bl uh, blow. Man, that's some good stuff. And the thing is, Kent Williams still is not up to his full powers. He is pretty damn nice. But within a couple years, Kent Williams would, Kent Williams would kind of be flawless. So he says, uh, I'd like to settle up my tab, innkeeper. And he takes off his necklace, the sign. And he's got like... 20 of them now because he killed all those guys. Okay. Oh, this is a waste of space. Just more self promotion. It's a history of Dreadstar. And just talks about all the, you know, he started in Epic Illustrated, number one, and all the graphic novels. It's just an ad for the comic. Because now Dread Star and Company is going to start. It's the second title that's going to reprint the Dread Star comics for newsstand sales. Fucking annoying. That's a lot of pages just for a fucking ad. A lot of letters this issue. Uh, and here we have a preview, another ad basically. But you do get to see, you know, some nice art. Uh, I guess there was a Marvel graphic novel at the time called The Raven Banner, Tale of Asgard. Kind of about the Warriors Three and a lot of the other denizens of Asgard other than Thor. It was written by Alan Zelenitz, artwork by Charles Vess. So we get to see some nice Charles Vess artwork, you know, beautiful colors and everything. Not his best, though. I mean, his little short stories in Epic look a lot better than this. But then again, I don't think... Charles Vess ever had to draw 48 pages in a row. Yeah, for like a Thor comic, this is better than probably 99% of them. But I don't know. It's just an excerpt, so I'm not even going to talk about it. It's not even a complete story. Ah, but this makes up for it. <laughs> and the Dread Star ad. Another Rick Geary. And this one's amazing. Journey to Outer Earth. Now, uh, a few weeks ago, maybe a couple months ago, I did the Rick Geary compilation. This was in it. So I'm not going to go over the whole thing again. But basically, it's about these people who live in the center of the earth. They've lived there forever. To them, the surface world is just a myth. It's just like, I don't know, this, nobody's ever been. And so they mount an expedition and they pop out of the ground and, you know, discover earth. Excuse me a second. I got some schmutz on here. It's going to make me sad. I like my comics in pristine mint condition. Just great. Prime Rick Geary. Such a great cartoonist. Here we have uh, another chapter of Toad Swart and the Ambrostone by Tim Conrad. So the... If you remember last time, the King's forces are outside. Waxroth's going to do battle with him. He's the, you know, the prince of the castle. But he just has like three soldiers going out there, but they're going to go with his golem. So he doesn't need that many soldiers. Apparently the golem is pretty fucking strong. His nice art. And Tim Conrad. I 
love that the weight of the golem there he just looks so solid and so he's giving his soldiers uh orders he says when you see the king's soldiers pour this crap on his head whatever it is And uh, then Waxroth goes visit uh, his old vizier slash magician, Lachnose, who's now in jail, in prison. Waxroth is convinced that he's the traitor, that he's working with the king. He doesn't seem to have any evidence. They still haven't said why he thinks that. There's this guy here who's kind of on Lachnose's side. He's, I mean, he's supposed to be watching him, but he's also like, oh, this is just a shameful thing. I don't agree with this. I don't like it. So he takes Lachnos to the torture chamber. And the other guy is uh, trying to tell him to stop. But, you know, he's his ruler. He can't uh, go against his ruler. So then we cut away to um, the three soldiers in the golem are outside the army camp. And they pour the crap on his head. So it's fucking clobbering time. So I guess that just turns him into a a whirlwind of combat. <laughs> he just attacks the king's troops and they're all just like, what the fuck? They're freaking out. They keep cutting back between this and uh, Waxroth. Lord Waxroth torturing Lachnos. And Lachnos still is taunting him. He's just this brave old guy. He doesn't give... He's just like, eh, you're still an idiot. And we find something about uh, Toad Swart's nature. He's the narrator. And he's saying how, like, he kind of feels disconnected from all this drama. It's, it's almost like he says, I wanted him to suffer. I wanted them all to suffer as I had suffered. Because he's had such, such a shitty little life, Toadswart. I mean, just people have been cruel to him. He's a deformed little midget, and everyone just picks on him. Nobody gives him any respect his whole life. So he's turned bitter, and he just wants everyone to suffer like he suffered. Oh, man. He was some real clobber in time. <laughs> Look at that. It's like the best Hulk comic you never read. So this next story is very odd. I don't know why they did this. So apparently like a few years ago in Epic, there was a Pepe Moreno story, black and white story called Survival. And it was about this guy who comes back to Earth and there's all these like zombie or at least cannibals there. These mutants who live off, feed off each other. And... It was based on an earlier color story that he submitted to a magazine and they lost it. And he just thought, oh, I'll never see that again. So they published that other story that was kind of based on, you know, this story. And then they found it after a couple of years and returned it to him. So Archie Goodwin said, sure. So it's very different than the original story in, in a lot of ways. It's nice to see Pepper Moreno color art. <clears throat> the original was in black and white. So just that is a pretty is a nice treat. And some of the panels are actually were in the other comic. Cause I guess he had like photo stats or Xeroxes of the comic that was lost. So he uh some of these panels are in that other comic, but in black and white. The guy is, uh, so basically in this one, this guy is, uh, he has to deliver someone to earth for a funeral. Some hugely rich person was like, I want to be buried on the birthplace of, you know, humanity, earth, which has been a dead planet forever. He thinks it's kind of stupid, but he doesn't care. He's going to get a lot of money for doing this mission. And he keeps thinking about all the fun he's going to have at the pleasure pl uh, planet. He's just going to go crazy when he gets all that money. There's a nice page. Very, uh, Planet of the Apes. So he has a human voice.
coming from this like this underground area, which we recognize as a subway tunnel. And he sees this guy chomping down on some food. And I th these are very similar to the panels in the original. But here they have a different motivation. They, they're just, they don't know this guy. But they're just like, hang, stay with us forever. And so he escapes and he makes it to the pleasure planet. And then we see him, the same guy, it was just a dream. His fellow ghouls are like, wake up. There's more scavengers up top. We can, we're gonna eat them. We get enough food for weeks. It's like, you have to face reality. And so I guess he's like a junky ghoul. <laughs> There's some drugs, morphine. And he just can't accept his new fate. So he just keeps shooting up all the time and staying high, living in this fantasy world. And his fellow ghouls are just like, man, you got to face reality sometime. In a way, this is kind of a more interesting plot and character than the other one. But just very odd that Epic would publish basically two versions of the same story. So there you have it, Epic Illustrated, number 30. Ah, some great stuff, really great stuff, some really annoying stuff, which is, I guess, par for the course for Epic. But I mean, just get a Rick Geary story, getting that color Cerebus and uh, beautiful Ken Williams art. You know, there's worse comics to own. So I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, I hope to see you next time here at the Hercules Pedics Academy of comic book studies.